Hi. One of the basic function of a fermenter is to maintain the condiment. The microorganism living inside the fermenter should not come out because most of the time we are culturing the microorganism which is capable of producing enzymes or producing a hormone or producing a toxin or this microorganism can be used as a vaccine or something like that in the fermenter. So if this microorganism come out of, out of the fermenter, it may lead to the human health issues or the environmental degradation or uh, pollution or something like that. So we don't want the microorganism, leaving microorganism to come out. It is especially important when we are using the genetically modified organism. So we want all the microorganism should be present only inside the fermenter. So we invest too much to maintain the condiment uh, of the fermenter. In this session, I am going to talk about the condiment regulations. So the basic function of the fermenter including aseptic operation and the condiment. Aseptic operation is the protection against contamination. The entry of the, the aseptic operation, we prevent the entry of foreign microorganism outside the microorganism into the fermenter. In condiment, we prevent cell escape from the fermenter. We want the cells to be confined into the fermenter. They should, that should not be uh, come out. And in some fermentations, we need strict condiment, like especially for the genetically modified organism. We need strict condiment. We won't, don't want any one of them to come out. But in other cases, we don't need that much condiment. Look like if you are making wine, it's a bioprocess technology, it's a fermentation. But yeast is not that uh, pathogenic organism. If it come out, nothing will happen. So in those cases, we don't need strict condiment things. But if you are growing some toxic organism like maybe Salmonella typhi, you need strict condiment. So the level of condiment required for a fermenter vary depending on the type of organism. So what we do, there is a mechanism, there is a system of assessing the risk of the organism, assess the pathogenicity of the organism and based on the how dangerous the organism is, we will uh, assign the fermenters into different condiment levels and we will go for the uh, condiment regulations. And uh, you might have heard about something called the good laboratory practices, GLP, which you need to be maintained in the laboratory when we are dealing with the microorganism. In our microbiology experiments, we ask you to wear lab coats, we ask you to not to eat in your lab or not to drink, not to stoke, smoke, things like that. And when we are using the laminar flow flow inoculation, we ask you to uh, wipe your hands with the alcohol and uh, the uh, laminar should be on and then uh, a flame should be there, things like that. We said as a part of the good laboratory practices. In industry, we have another set of practices which is called good industrial large scale practices, GILSP, which is similar to the uh, similar in principle with the good laboratory practices. This one is to maintain the aseptic condition in the laboratory. So some organism, we don't need to have the strict condiment regulations just like yeast or something like that or yeast, lactobacillus. These all are the non-pathogenic organisms, but some other organism, we need strict condiment. So the uh, non-pathogenic organism, we can actually use the uh, good industrial large scale practices to prevent condiment, to assure condiment, but other organism we may need strict condiment regulations. So in order to know how how much condiment is needed for an organism, we actually first go for the hazard level analysis. Based on the process, based on the microorganism, we will do a hazard level analysis and based on the hazard level, we will assign the microorganism, the fermenters into different condiment level. So hazard level analysis is based on following factors. First one is pathogenicity of the organism. If the organism is highly pathogenic, it is high hazard level. If the organism is not pathogenic, it is low hazard level, which is not dangerous, right? Virulence, uh, which is also similar to the pathogenicity. Uh, if highly virulent organism need be contained very strictly, just like Ebola virus or something like that, it's highly virulent. Then number of microorganisms necessary to cause diseases. Some microorganism, only few microorganisms, maybe 10 or 20 microorganisms is enough to cause the disease. But some other microorganism, it need a good number. So based on the number of microorganism, we can do the hazard level analysis. Route of infection, infection by direct contact, like direct blood contact is necessary for the transmission of some type of diseases, like hepatitis B. 
which need the direct blood contact. But some other organism like COVID-19 doesn't need a direct contact. It is spread to the air. So the COVID-19 is more infectious than the uh, hepatitis B. Okay. Uh, so route of infection is important. Uh, then the presence of local vectors or potential reservoirs. If the local vectors are there, the chance of spreading the disease is high. Uh, potential reservoirs are there, the chance of infection is high. Then availability of prophylaxis or treatment. If the vaccine for the same thing is already exists, uh, it is not that much hazardous. Like if if you're in industry, if you are growing some type of microorganism and which is we know it is hazardous, it is pathogenic, we can actually give the vaccine uh, to the all the employees, maybe to their family members also, so that we can actually reduce the hazard. Okay, and it is good to have the treatment. Some diseases we don't have any, uh, have the treatment. In those cases, this organism will be considered as highly hazardous. Then scale of fermentation. For small scale, we don't need that much containment. But if you are increasing the scale, the containment level should be increased because which is more pathogenic, uh, more dangerous. Type of process, whether we are doing a batch culture, fed batch culture or continuous culture. And what are the type of techniques uh, used for the fermentation is also uh, used to measure the hazard of the organism. So based on these points, what we do, we will assess the hazard level of the process, the whole process, how hazardous is the process. And based on the hazard level, we will assign the fermentation to different containment level. And we can easily explain the whole thing by using this diagram. So, it is not as complicated as it seems. First, the process organism, first question to assign the containment level for an organism is whether the organism is genetically engineered or not genetically engineered. The containment for the non-genetically engineered organism is less and the containment regulation for the genetically engineered organism is very high. So we always think that genetically organ engineered organisms may be more pathogenic and there is no more possibility of uh, unexpected outcomes. So we always think that the genetically engineered organisms are more dangerous than the non genetically origin organism so the first question is whether the organism is genetically engineered or not genetically engineered if it, it is non genetically engineered organism we'll go for the hazard analysis based on the points i have described in the previous slide uh, this organism will be allocated into four different group hazard group one two three and four and the hazard group 1 is the least hazardous organism and the hazard group 4 is the most hazardous organism. Then, once we know the hazard group of the process, we will recommend the containment level. If the organism is hazard group 1, we don't need any containment regulation. We can just follow good industrial large scale product practices. That's enough for hazard level 1 organism. You don't need to have the containment facilities. If it is in the hazard group 2, we will go for containment level 1. For hazard group 3, containment level 2. And hazard level 4 organism, we should follow the containment level 3 procedure. That's how it's go. So it starts with 1, but it starts from a good laboratory in the skill, uh, scale portrait practice. So the most dangerous organism, most pathogenic organism will be in the hazard loop 4. So we'll use containment level 3 to uh, the prevent spread of that organism. So that's about the non-genetically engineered organism. In this, in the case of genetically engineered organism, again we ask another question whether the genetically engineered organism is uh, group 1 or group 2. Group 1 is harmless group, uh, group 2 is potentially harmful group. There is always another group uh, which may be always harmful group. We don't do the industrial large scale production of that uh, like harmful group of organism so we can do the fermentation industrial fermentation only with the harmless group and a potentially harmful group if it is harmless for sm small scale production scale production uh, we don't need any containment regulation we can do it because it is harmless even though it is genetically engineered it is harmless and we are doing small scale fermentation it's okay but if you are doing large scale fermentation with the, this group one the containment level is B and we should follow B1 good industrial large scale practices. Okay, so the containment level is B and the practices is called B1 good industrial large scale practices. 
okay then if the genetically engineer organism is belongs to group 2 which is potentially harmful group for small scale there is no industrial standards for large scale it is containment level b which is again divided into b2 b3 and b4 so b2 is being least harmful and b4 is potentially more harmful than b2 and b3 so that's how we are assigning containment level so based on the hazard level and the genetic engineering we can actually assign different containment level for each organism so that's all about the containment facilities now we are going to i am going to talk more about the fermenters first thing is body of the fermenter by using what material we are actually making the fermenter so fermenters at the different scales we are making with the different types of components uh, as we know the laboratory scale fermenters are too small it may be containing one or two liters maybe 10 liters or 50 liters that's the maximum in case of pilot scale reactors uh, which is bigger may to have maybe thousand or hundred or thousand liters capacity and the industrial scale fermenters has the several hundred liter capacity so as the size of the fermenter increases the building material of the fermenter will also uh, differ and for all scales scales of fermentation we need a fermenter which can resist the repeated steam sterilization as i said before the bioreactors are sterilized using high pressure steam so uh, whether it is a laboratory scale pilot scale or industrial scale we need fermenters which can resist the steam sterilization okay so uh, the materials what we are using to build the fermenter should be able to resist this repeated high pressure high temperature uh, sterilization procedure basically we are using two different materials for the uh, construction of the fermenter first one is yeah, glass glass is basically used for the construction of laboratory scale fermenters uh, and which is uh, maybe 1 to 30 liter capacity uh, so it's good to have the glass fermenters in laboratory because it is easy to observe uh, and it is fancy uh, so it will you can see uh, directly observe everything okay and for the glass we are actually using boron silicate battery jars which are very resistant to many uh, chemicals and uh, physical stress which is uh, sterilizable and everything so glass fermenters are made up of boron silicate battery jars uh, its advantages are they are smooth surface they are non toxic it won't react to anything uh, it's corrosion free you know it's acetic glass it is corrosion free and uh, the most of time the glass uh, glass fermenters we have a top plate which is made of stainless steel so that we can actually have the sampling points the stirrer shaft sample uh, sensors and everything will be in the top plate and this top plate is basically made up of stainless steel and uh, all other parts will be made up of glass and one other uh, main advantage is to easy to examine we can actually see the fermentation happening and we can sterilize in two different ways either autoclaving this laboratory cell fermenters are too small so actually we can take the fermenter and put it in a bigger autoclave to sterilize it or there is a profession of in situ sterilization just like the bigger fermenters there will be uh, options in which we can actually pump the sterile uh, like high pressure steam into the fermenter to have the in situ sterilization and for the glass fermenters diameter is usually more than 50 centimeters and a laboratory scale fermenter look like this as i said it is made up of glass and there is stands are there and in the top we have a plate here is the motor there are sensors sampling points and everything then this is the control unit okay in this fermenter we have the steel plate only at the top the bottom is just glass in some other cases we have the uh, steel plates both in top and bottom side uh, which will be more resistance to the steam sterilization and this type of fermenters can be uh, used for the in situ sterilization okay so small scale fermenters are basically made up of glass what about pilot and large scale fermenters these fermenters are mainly made up of stainless steel because it is huge oleum it need to be more resistant and it is handling high volumes of uh, medium it should be more stronger so we are using stainless steel to make uh, pilot and large scale fermenters it can be sterilized in situ as it is large in size we cannot actually find a autoclave which is larger than that so we will use uh, in situ sterilization uh, procedure 
uh, it can withstand high pressure and uh, corrosion with stainless steel and in the stainless steel there is a hydrous foam hydrous uh, film in the surface of the metal which is continuous non porous insoluble and self heating which is actually giving all this property to the stainless steel okay and the stainless steel can be made up of different alloys and basically we will say uh, the alloys with the chromium uh, the chromium alloys are not really corrode rust or stain they are very resistant and we used to add nickel uh, to increase resistance and engineering properties so that we can make the way we want and we will add molybdenum to improve resistance to halogen salt because most of the time the fermentation have high amount of nacl uh, so it should be resistant to halogens and as you know stainless steel can uh, comes in different combinations like uh, as per the aisa uh, standards there are different types of stainless steel like stainless steel 304 which has a specific set of composition then 316l then 420 so there are different grades of stainless steel so depending on our process we are using uh, different types okay all of them contain carbon chromium nickel molybdenum silicon uh, manganese and phosphorus so the most commonly used type of uh, steel in bioprocess industry is 316 and 316 l uh, they have the uh, resistant high resistance to the acids alkali halogens and everything uh, so we are basically using this 316 and you should study the composition of the 316 steel which contain 18 percent chromium 10 percent nickel 22.25 percent molybdenum and uh, when we are using this stainless steel as a building material uh, the metals uh, the regions when the metal joins we use a o-ring you might have seen the o-ring in the pressure cookers or autoclaves so this o-ring seal is used to seal of the uh, stainless steel uh, fermenters so that's all about the body of the fermenter thank you so much for listening